Our passage this morning is from Romans chapter 3. We're in a series called His Story, looking at the grand story of Scripture. And today we're going to look at the only thing that actually works. And you might not believe it right now, but uh, I'm hoping that you'll be able to see it before we leave here today. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Now apart from the law, uh, I'm sorry, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. I, I wish I could tell you what a huge statement that is, but back in that day, that was the greatest difference. And he's saying there's no difference, and then he explains why. For all have what? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. This is the part that our culture and the modern mind really struggle with. Why does there need to be a sacrifice? Why does there need to be the shedding of blood? And he says, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. The idea we're looking at is that there's a grand story to scripture. If you don't know the grand story, it will feel like a lot of random stories, some poetry, and some instructions. But once you know the grand story, you begin to realize that God uses all of those other stories to tell this grand story, and it actually helps us make sense of the Bible. More importantly, it'll also help you make sense of your own life because you are, in fact, part of God's grand story. So we're going to talk today about this concept of sacrifice, and it's very unsettling to modern people. If you read scripture, particularly the Old Testament, you will see that it is bathed in the blood of sacrifices. And there are lots of people who consider that a very primitive concept. And in fact, it is offensive to them and it feels like it's born out of superstition. And the question becomes is, why can't God just forgive someone without a sacrifice? Why is it necessary that blood be shed? And so today, not only are we going to examine that question, but I think by the time you leave here today, you will realize that sacrifice is the only thing that works. Sacrifice is the only thing that works. You see, in everyday life, we tend to enjoy things that are the result of someone else making a sacrifice. For example, we live in a country that has bestowed upon us certain freedoms. And of course, those freedoms were not just bequeathed to individuals or to our nation, wrapped up in, a, in wrapping paper and sealed with a bow. There are people who had to make an incredible sacrifice for us to be able to enjoy those freedoms. And they still make such sacrifices for us to enjoy such freedoms. We're sitting in a pretty decent facility this morning in order to worship. There are individuals who made significant sacrifice so that this place could exist. If you enjoy music, you should know that musicians spend thousands of hours practicing and learning, sacrificing their time and sacrificing their attention so that they're able to present something to us that we can enjoy. If you go to a doctor when you are sick, she sacrificed thousands of hours in classrooms and studying texts and doing internships because you don't want to go into a doctor's office and they're about to do a procedure and they're YouTubing how to do it. That is not one you want to go to. All right? You want to go to the person who has practiced this a lot of times and they're good at it. And parents, if you are a parent, you have sacrificed for your children. You sacrifice sleep. You sacrifice money. You sacrifice time. You sacrifice money. You sacrifice energy. You sacrifice money. I mean, it's just, it's amazing the sacrifices that we make. And here's the thing. If, if, if we didn't sacrifice, if none of these sacrifices were made, we'd all wind up naked in a field feeling sick and surrounded by poorly behaved children screaming and crying. It would not go well for us. Sacrifice is the only thing that works in our world. 
And the only alternative to sacrifice is theft and murder. This is the choice our culture gets to make. And every culture before us and any culture that follows us. We all make sacrifices. Of course, you are the only one who really knows what you sacrifice and who you sacrifice for. But what I'd like to focus our attention on a little bit is why do we sacrifice? And sacrifice enhances relationship. This is the number one reason we sacrifice. Sacrifice enhances relationship. We give up something we love for someone we love even more. We give up all of the things I talked about earlier because we love someone. You see, sacrifice is actually evidence of love. Whoever tells you that two can live as cheap as one lied. <laughs> I don't know what they were selling, but you shouldn't buy it. Uh, that has not been the experience of anyone I have ever met. It's going to cost you something to build a loving relationship with someone. The second thing that sacrifice does is sacrifice secures a better future. Sacrifice secures a better future. You see, if we consume everything right now, we won't have anything for the future. The ability to discipline ourselves now for a better future, well, this is actually unique to humans. No other animal does this. Uh, if we, we have the capacity to delay gratification, and the reason we do that is because we think the future could actually be better than the present. If you see a person who has no capacity for delay gratification, it just simply means they believe that their future can't be better and they better enjoy everything and consume everything they possibly can right now. You see, th this is an interesting thing. If, if you were a wolf and you, you downed an elk, um, a wolf will actually eat up to 40 pounds of meat at one time. And think about that. They're smaller than you. A quarter pounder fills me up. Can you imagine? 40 pounds. Why do they do that? Because a wolf never thinks, you know, I've got a big elk here. And if I can find a cool, dry place, I can come back and eat off of this for the next week. They don't ever think that thought. They get all that they can right now. And they don't stop until they're full. And then they kind of stagger off. Uh, that's, that's the way the world works. So where does this concept... By the way, sacrifice is the evidence of hope. The reason you sacrifice is because you believe that there's something better coming tomorrow. That's the reason that we do it. So where did this concept start? Who came up with the idea of sacrifice? And you might be surprised. The very first sacrifice ever made was made by God. If you don't know the story, let me share it with you. Adam and Eve had been created by God in his image. And they lived in a place that was paradise. It was a garden that had been created for them. And they only had one rule, just one rule. How many wish we only had one rule? Wouldn't that be great? And the one rule was, don't eat of the fruit of that tree because it'll bring death into your lives and into our world. And this tree had the capacity to impart knowledge, but at an incredibly destructive price. And they partook of it. And they brought suffering into paradise and into our world. And suddenly they were self-conscious. They were naked, and now they were shamed. And they hid from each other. They actually sowed fig leaves. And they hid from each other, and they hid from God when God called and came to meet with them, as he did every single day. This time, instead of running to him, they ran away from him. When God found them, they admitted what they had done, and they added a new skill to the repertoire. It was blaming. They blamed each other, and they even blamed God. And the shame was overwhelming to them. They couldn't stand to be in God's presence. And so God did something about it. He made garments for Adam and Eve from the skins of animals. He clothed them. It helped them feel less awkward in his presence. And they would remember that. They would pass along this knowledge to their offspring that when an animal is sacrificed, you feel less awkward when you approach God. It's also embedded into the very first Passover that ever occurred. The nation of Israel had been enslaved by Egypt for over 400 years. And uh, God wanted them to 
go out from there into a future, a promised land that was better than anything they had known in their lives up to this point. And of course, the, things about, the, the thing that's true about slave owners is that they never just release their slaves because their slaves want to go. And so uh, the pharaoh of Egypt had his fists tightly, tightly clenched around them, and he would not let them go. And the, God sent a series of plagues to pry those fingers off the nation of Israel. And the last plague was a destroyer that would be released throughout the land. And this destroyer was completely non-biased. This, that's why that passage, what we read when it says, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. This destroyer made no distinction between Jewish people and Egyptian people. And it went through, and, and wherever there was sin that had been committed in the house, it would destroy the firstborn of that house. Now, you might ask, why would it go after the firstborn? And that's a great question. Because in that culture, people thought differently than we do. Now, if you are a parent and you've amassed some resources that you're passing, it usually gets divided equally among your offspring. But in those days, that was not the case. In those days, the oldest son would get the lion's share of the inheritance. And there was a specific reason for that. And that is because it's the only way your family could build wealth over generations. So if you had so much land and you had five sons, then when you died, you would divide that amongst five. And then when they, when they died, they would divide it among however many children they had. And when they died, they would divide it under however many children they had. And by the time you get through a few generations, there's almost nothing left to survive on. And so they used the concept of the oldest son getting the lion's share so that the family could build wealth over time. And so they also understood that meant that since he got the lion's share to build wealth, it also made him the one that was accountable and responsible for any debts of the family. And so when the destroyer goes through, it's the oldest son that's going to pay the price. In that culture, everybody understood that. Our culture is quite different, so that's hard for us to accept. And here's what's fascinating about that, is that God tells Moses, very important piece of information, this destroyer is not going to distinguish between you and between the Egyptians. It's going to come to every house. And since all have sinned, every single house is at risk. So here's what you can do. You can kill a lamb, and you can take the blood from that lamb, and you can sprinkle it on the door frame. And when the destroyer goes through the land, and he's going to go through so fast, you can't even calculate his speed. When he goes through the land, he's going to see blood on the door frame of your house, and he's going to say, death has already come to this house, and he will pass over your house. Why was God doing that? Because God understood that there was a better future than slavery for his people. And by the way, that was an incredibly limited example of destruction. One night only, in a limited location. So that's how that got embedded into Passover. And it actually got embedded into the law. God codifies sacrifice. Why? Simple. He wants us to feel less awkward when we approach him. And he wants us to know that he loves us. And he wants us to know that he has a wonderful future planned for us. That brings us to this point. Every person needs a sacrifice because every person has sinned. Every person needs a sacrifice because every person has sinned. Now, no one actually believes they're perfect. I can prove it, all right? Anyone who thinks you're absolutely perfect, never having made a single mistake or done anything out of bounds or wrong, either intentionally or unintentionally, please stand to your feet right now. No takers. And by the way, if they did, I just hand them the microphone. We'll let them finish the message because, like, that's going to be a better message. Here's the thing. No one believes they're perfect, but this is what we struggle with. We don't ever believe that our imperfections require a sacrifice. We downplay the mistakes we've made. It's not that big a deal. So I told a lie. What's the big deal? So I didn't keep my promise. What difference did it really make? Well, I can tell you something that uh, might be worth our thinking about. People are incredibly resilient in recovering from crises and disasters. Uh, this last summer, we've just seen a string of these things between hurricanes and natural disasters all over. And by the way, some man-made disasters, too. And when we watch that, it's astonishing how incredibly resilient people are and they can recover, and they can rebuild, and it's, it is astonishing to watch that. It is. I don't know what it is about the human spirit that can just face that stuff, 
and just start rebuilding. But there is something people do not do that with. And it is when they are betrayed or they have been deceived by someone that they thought was safe and someone that they loved. And when that happens to them, people really struggle to ever recover from that. It takes them to a dark place that some people never, ever get out of. And the very things that we downplay are the very things that do the most damage in our world. It does the most damage to people when we get betrayed by someone that we trusted. Now, uh, we don't actually fix that situation by telling people, well, it wasn't that big a deal. That only makes it worse. See, God made the first sacrifice. But as it turns out, God also made the last sacrifice that would ever be necessary. He sent his one and only son. And he's the only one who actually loved his father with all his heart, with all his strength, with all his mind. He's the, he loved his father perfectly. And he's the only human being who ever perfectly loved his neighbor as himself. He is always, he always responded appropriately to any situation or opportunity that he was in. He was never afraid to speak truth to power. He was never embarrassed to be associated with those who were socially outcast. He never misused his power to benefit himself. When he taught, he helped people understand God in such astonishing ways that they actually wanted to draw closer to him rather than run away from him. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He brought freedom to the most unbelievable bondages that people were struggling with. And how did the power structures, both the religious power structures and the political power structures, how did they respond to this perfect person? They hated him. They threatened him. They lied about him. They had him arrested, and they had him killed. And in case you're wondering, humanity has not evolved upward in the last 2,000 years. If Jesus were to take on a teaching assignment in present-day world reality, the same power structures would do the exact same thing they did back then. We have not evolved. That's what happened to Jesus. So why? And the first thing is this, is that justice requires a sacrifice. The passage in Romans we read said that this had to happen so that God could be just. God knew it was going to happen. God let it happen because the sacrifice of his perfect son could pay the debt for imperfect people. If you're not perfect, then you can't pay the debt for anybody else. The best you could ever hope is that you could spend an eternity trying to repay the debt for yourself. But a perfect person, they can repay the debt. Now, here's the thing. Why is this thing about justice so important? It's because no one thinks it's a good idea to let injustice go without payment. So let me give you a couple examples of this. Um, let's suppose you're walking down the sidewalk today because it's such a beautiful October day. Has anybody noticed the weather? It's disorienting. I can't figure it out. I walked out this morning and I was, the, the outside of the car was, was warmer than the inside of the car in October. So. You walk out, you're walking down the sidewalk, it's a beautiful day for a walk, and someone, either because they're texting or because they're intoxicated, their car veers up onto the sidewalk and it hits you, and you wind up in critical condition in a hospital. Your body is just broken and mangled, and the good news is they think that you will recover. The bad news is um, it, you're going to know pain for a lot of the rest of your life. And so let's suppose that this person appears before the judge and, and there you are in a body cast in the courtroom waiting to hear what the judge is going to say. And the judge comes to the bench and says, you know what, my coffee was especially good this morning and my breakfast was the best I've ever had. I'm in the best mood I've ever been in in my life. So whoever's on the docket to come before me today, you're free and clear to go. No punishment, no penalty, no jail time, no fines. You're good. And you would sit there in the courtroom and you would scream, that's not just. That's not fair. You can't do that. Or let's suppose that 
a person was actually responsible for the death of one of your family members. And you're waiting for justice to be done. And you go into the courtroom and the judge just says, you know what? I've decided today I'm giving everybody a pass. The only people that would be happy about that would be the people who were guilty of the crimes that they had committed. But anybody who suffered as a result of the crimes that they had committed would think that was an incredibly unjust thing to do. Can we please understand this? There, our sins always hurt other people. And for God to say, it doesn't really matter, would not be just. The biggest deception in our world is the only person I'm hurting is myself. It's simply not true. It's never been true. And so we need a sacrifice in order for there to be justice. We also need a sacrifice for there to be forgiveness. We need a sacrifice so that there can be forgiveness. What does this mean? Well, all forgiveness, in case you don't know this, all forgiveness actually requires suffering. All forgiveness requires suffering. Now, usually, this is how it works. So somebody does something to you, and it hurts you, it costs you something, you're not happy about it, and so what do you want them want to have happen? You want them to experience some pain, too. And so, a lot of times, we'll just try to impose pain on them. We've all got our little strategies for this pain management process but we try to impose pain. And what's the goal? We want them to feel what we have felt. And here's the thing. This is the most astonishing thing. There can come a point at which they have experienced enough pain that you will actually forgive them. Now, I see this more often than most people because of the rooms that I'm in. I can be in a room where there's been a rift in a, between family members for decades. They will not speak to each other. They will not talk to each other. They will not visit each other's homes. They have nothing good to say about each other. And then one of them is laying in critical condition in an ICU room or in a critical care area of the hospital. And eventually, because of the pain that that person is in, it breaks something down and this person is actually able to say, okay, I forgive you. See? All forgiveness requires suffering. But here's the challenge. When we require the other person to suffer, then evil wins. And by the way, there's a lot of stuff that we wish would happen that doesn't. When you impose pain on other people, the only way you can do that is if your heart gets a little bit harder. And by the way, they don't ever learn what it was that they did to you. They just learn not to do something like that to you anymore because you issue out a lot of pain back to them. They didn't learn anything except how to avoid more pain. But if you decide you are going to absorb the pain, everything changes. So let's say you go, all right, what they did was not right. And by the way, this doesn't mean you can't tell them that or you can't hold them accountable to that, but your decision is, I'm not going to hurt them back. When you do that, that means you're the one who's going to feel the pain. If you've ever had to forgive anyone, you know what this is like. You feel the pain. But when you absorb the pain, your heart does not get hard, and the individual actually can come to realize that what they did was wrong. And this is what God does for us. He could impose the pain on us, but he refuses to do it. He absorbs the pain. His heart, he will not let get hard because he loves us and he has a future for us. That's what God wants us to remember. Someone has to suffer. He's willing to do it. Now, why do sacrifices offend us? Why does God sending his son do, to do this for us offend us? And I will tell you why. And it's because the only reason he has to do it is because our sacrifices are not enough. And that is a bitter pill to swallow. If you sacrifice everything for your kids and they turn out to be bad adults, it will cause you great pain. You, I don't understand. I did everything. I, I gave up everything for them. How could, they, how could they turn out like this? How could they do this to me? And, and this is what you think. My sacrifice was not enough. 
But as hard as that is to take, what's even worse is when you see parents who seem to not offer anywhere near as much sacrifice for their kids, and their kids are just ridiculous successes. And you just go, well, that's not right. Um, why do we try so hard to prove to God and others that our sacrifices are good enough? And when we do, God tells us it isn't. But he has provided a sacrifice that is good enough. And here's the question. If the sacrifice of Jesus was good enough for God to forgive all of your sins, why shouldn't it be good enough for you to accept that? Last two points. These are quick. I know you're worried, but don't worry. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross is evidence that God loves you you. It's the most quoted and famous verse in the entire Bible. John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And God has a future that includes you in it. The thought of eternity without you was so unacceptable to God, he was willing to pay any price, and he did. A price had to be paid or he couldn't be just. Someone had to absorb the pain, or there wasn't forgiveness that was possible. But he was willing to do both so that we could forever be part of his family. You see, God not only loves you, God has a future for you that's better than any present you have right now. Let's bow our heads this morning. It's the only thing that works. Consuming everything we have, constantly trying to be involved in a program where our good outweighs our bad. It's just a never-ending cycle of insecurity and exhaustion. And God knows it. And so he just simply said, I will do what's necessary so you don't have to feel awkward in my presence. And I will do what is necessary so that your future with me is secure. And he did. And if you're willing to trust that, it changes everything. So Father, would you help us recognize we cannot fix the ultimate realities of our heart and our soul by our own efforts. But you have not left us on our own. You have paid the price for us. I ask that you would help us trust that freshly and fully today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?